It's the big show, Summer with the Stars, and it's Alex Belfield talking to my favourite people and gorgeous people as well, like Trisha Goddard. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for that, Alex. <laughs> it's nice to talk to you. i tell you why, because you seem to know what you're doing and you're not scared of it, are you? You do it with confidence. I would hope so. I would hope so. That comes after a lifetime and a, a lot of different experiences. Um, if you like getting a degree through the University of Life. <laughs> <laughs> and you've had one. I've just read this new book of yours, and what a life it's been. That's got to help with a TV show, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't know how much I've experienced because we all think of our lives as, as normal or ordinary, um, even though I've called the book a, a life less ordinary. But yes, it, it does help. And add to that that I've um, spent a good 20 years working in the area of, of mental health as well. Um you know and parenting and a lot of different other things that I've added to my basic journalism if you like and uh, yes the show had that extra dimension because of that and let's talk about your life right from the beginning what were you like as a child were you always curious oh gosh yes um I was irrepressible um I had a hell of a lot of of energy great imagination which I used to escape things if, if things weren't very good I'd, I'd go and escape in my own little world be it with the Barbie dolls taking them camping and spinning out you know actually making films in my head as it were adventures and I actually started making films for real when I was about uh, 13 or 14 um, in, in fact, I was one of the runners up in the BBC's Young Film Director of the Year Award for a couple of years. Um, and another running up, runner up was this young guy called Nick Parks. <laughs> 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 Did these silly cartoons. And I met up with him um, a few years ago at a, a do at Buckingham Palace. And he said, oh, I remember you, you were one of the runners up with your film. And, you know, and there's, of course, Nick Parks has gone on to do wallace and gromit mm. so we said let's go and find john craven <laughs> so we went we went off and found john craven and we said you might not remember us but we were both <laughs> runners up in young film director of the year award in the same year and he said really who came first and we said exactly <laughs> <laughs> why didn't we win <laughs> what was nick like in those days because i had him on the program a couple of years ago and did an hour with him and he was the most peculiar but lovable man i've ever met um nerd is the word i think <laughs> but actually i would have been seen as a nerd because in those days to make films you were you, we were using cement splicing using razor blades to file down the end of the film and match it up it, uh, you know and for a 13 year old girl to be heavily into doing that was seen as a bit weird having said that my my younger daughter who's 15 is heavily into things like mixing music and, and the technical side of a lot of things so I guess I've passed it on but I, I suppose I was I had a nerdy side of me which I used because in order to sort of augment my imagination imagination in my head was all very well but I had to sort of if you like get it out so I either wrote a lot and I did a, a lot of writing. In fact, I dedicated the, in, in part the book to Mrs. Millard, my English teacher at school. Uh, I did a lot of writing and I did a lot of filmmaking. And I was prepared to learn the technical side of stuff in order to get my storytelling or my telling of my life across. It's interesting when I've read parts of your book, the one thing that seems to come across to me, and I could be wrong, is that mm. you're very focused, you're very determined and very tenacious. That's how you became such a big star down under. You've really become a bigger name down there through your production company than you have here through the TV show. I know, I know. It's a bit scary. When I was, I think I was nine, I got a, a diary and I wrote in it, um, I am going to play music, I'm going to travel the world, I'm going to be in a band and I'm going to be a film uh, producer. Well, I did travel the world. I was an air stewardess based in Bahrain um, in my, during my 20s for five years. Um, played music, yes. I was in an all-girl band for a number of years from, say, 15 up to 20. Eventually, we went touring. And film producer, I, I didn't get to be a film producer, but in those days, the idea of working in television um, was pretty far removed. The only black people you saw on television was the, the fledgling Jackson 5, actually. So, um, yeah, I, I pretty well fulfilled what I wrote in that diary at nine. So I guess you could call that focused, <laughs> driven, weird. <laughs> Obsessive compulsive. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> Just very quickly on the Jacksons, how do you feel about Michael Jackson? Shocked but not surprised. I think a lot of people have said that because I, I was talking to my, my kids about that and we said... 
which stars can we imagine old and Michael Jackson we just said we couldn't imagine him old someone like Madonna you can imagine old because she seems so disciplined and she doesn't do drugs or anything and she's just so focused and she's an athlete anybody who's a dancer is an athlete um people like Michael Jackson and I hate to say it people like Britney Spears who've had not had a childhood and have a whole load of issues that they've either dealt with or not dealt with in the public arena been surrounded by sycophants and yes people without much idea of who they really are they're the people that in in a mental health sense would flag up all the warning signs i I, trust me people like michael jackson britney spears um amy wine has all of those people were as young people had had some doings with a mental health service they would have had an at risk tag put to them and they would have got more help more assistance and more support being living say on a on a council estate or in everyday life than they would as a star i i actually do believe a lot of i, I know a lot of celebrities go through a lot of help hell go through a lot of things are subject to a lot of things that they would not have to go through if they were ordinary people there would be some intervention early on it's hard to sympathize though when you're a multimillionaire and being given everything from a person who who doesn't have that it's hard to understand why it's so difficult and i suppose with your mental health background Mm -hmm. you have an insight into why some people can handle it and some people can't yeah i think that there's two things it's interesting there are some people who i believe become successful because of their past and their past could be adverse um I I have to say I've met a lot of people who've had a lot of problems in their early lives and said I'm going to show them and become successful I'd say there's a 60% amongst British inverted commas celebrities like that of of those people there are a number who can handle what it brings their way there's a whole load of people who's really believe it when fans say I love you I love you I always say when people say oh you're so lucky you've got all those people who love you are they the same sorts of people who would love you when you're vomiting (laughs) down the toilet bowl or you or incontinent (laughs) you know no I don't think so they love what you represent but there are those people who have been childhood celebrities who've had maybe difficult backgrounds or just you know how do you stuff up when it's written all over the papers I mean you know every child every young person stuffs up but when that becomes something that is revisited year after year after year 15 20 years later remember when she shaved off her hair 30 years later um and you haven't got the most stable of backgrounds anyway add to that all the hangers on you're wonderful you're amazing no one who actually says no you're being a fool stop because they don't want to cut off the the money the fame etc and that makes for a very dangerous cocktail so you're saying you wouldn't be surprised if you were to read a tragedy about someone like Britney Spears because she's just going around that vicious circle of show business and continues to. Well, when does somebody say, I mean, and manage to stay and give her some boundaries and controls? And I would argue, it, it, people say, oh, well, the parents, I'm sorry if it wasn't there in the beginning. You have to, you know, you have to question what was going on. There are some very grounded Um, celebrities I'd offer up Justin Timberlake as one you know and you don't become it's not just people from the inverted commas ideal home background who become celebrities there are actually a lot of damaged people who become celebrities and as I say with the sycophants when you know if you've got a choice between becoming ill or signing yourself off and having a year off and maybe having some psychotherapy or going out and doing 50 concerts that's going to earn a shed load of money for a load of agents dancers managers etc is your manager going to say you know what stuff the fact that I can make how many millions from you doing 50 concerts you have a lie down for it a, a year mm. I don't think so let's get back to you because there's so much to talk about about your life and what's been written in the papers recently you write this book about your life and then of mm. course certain newspapers take elements of it and turn it into a big thing mm. how does it feel when you become the news opposed to interviewing people about their lives and trying to make the news it it is uncomfortable um i come from a a journalistic background i was an aussie newsroom journalist and trust me if you 
did your sign off too long your editor would be going mate i timed your sign off it was 30 bloody seconds who do you think the star is you know so you kept your head down and you did your job so i was never comfortable uh with the celebrity kind of aspect um a lot of people say oh well then why tell your story initially it came about because after i had um my breakdown in 1994 um I was in a psych hospital and uh, unfortunately there's always somebody who wants to make money out of your story and I I got a a call on the psych hospital from someone saying we know you're in there we're going to do a story on it and that at a time when you feel at your lowest and your most vulnerable and panicky is the most terrifying thing you know because up until then no one knew that I had gone into the psychiatric hospital so um i luckily i had a a a publicist at the channel i was at that in those days channel 10 in sydney and i'd helped her husband when he'd had some problems with depression so she said look we'll manage this and we called up a journalist whose partner i'd also helped when he'd had some mental health problems and we went round to her her house i was really shaky they signed me signed me out of the hospital and with this journalist who kind of I knew would report it responsibly because she'd had dealings with mental illness and mental health. We did the story and we said, yep, I've had a breakdown. This is what's happened. Um, I had to say that my marriage had broken up because obviously, you know, what do you say when you're asked about your partner? And we did that one interview, that one story, and that killed off the paparazzi and it killed off the story. And and if they were going to write about it, they had to do it from a factually correct base. Well, of course, with the internet and what have you, that story's regurgitated, you know, 15 years later. Mm. But again, the same thing with my my breast cancer. Nobody, bar my very, very closest family, my, my husband and daughters and my business partner, knew about that until somebody saw me at the hospital and Mm. you know the rest as they say is history earlier on on this program i was talking to jerry springer about his program and Mm. he basically is embarrassed by it he has no problem saying that it's a load of rubbish and that if you choose to watch it that's up to you he personally wouldn't how do you feel about your program trisha it's very different and i know jerry i've met jerry and we've discussed this it is a very very different kettle of fish jerry doesn't um say that he's got any expertise in in doing anything except for highlighting absurdities and stirring you know stirring the pot a bit i come to the program with a whole different set of skills um journalistic conflict resolution which i've studied um you know mental health which i've been in and continue to be involved in parenting again ditto the same thing so it stands to reason that i'm going to use those tools to to work through my my show and i think that's the thing about chat shows they they take on the the, the values of the person actually doing the the show so for instance someone would come on to my show for completely different set of reasons and they would go on to jerry uh springer show or in fact jeremy carl show um you you tend to find people who are genuine about wanting to change things and wanting help go aim towards my show because they know of my background they know that i'm going to listen and they know i have a firm set of skills a set of skills that the australian government used for 10 years that i've used with the health service and mental health services in this country so they know i'm going to employ all of that experience in listening to their problems i'm not going to bully them i'm not going to call them names i'm not going to just stir them up for the sake of stirring them up but yes people are going to say yes it's a television program there is a way of marrying the two and i would never put my mental health credentials in jeopardy um or a person's life in jeopardy with the show what do you think about that low-life scumbag jeremy kyle (laughs) everybody always asks me that why do they ask me that um listen as i said he his show takes on on his persona i've seen his show it's It's not very clever though is it bringing people on to just laugh at them humiliate them and make them look stupid just for ratings i think there is a there's going to be a moral conscience there and this man doesn't seem to see that at all well um, all i can say is i i look at things um wearing a mental health hat i mean how can i not since you know i'm i'm so deeply involved in it 
And I know that we had guests on our show who had maybe been to his show to do um, a DNA test because we wouldn't DNA test babies anymore. We decided, I decided, I mean, I brought DNA testing to television in this, in this country um, as I did the lie detector test. But then I sort of felt sick about the, the, the DNA testing of babies. We sometimes enable people to DNA test their, their children, but away from nothing to do with the television studios and we wouldn't report on it or identify the child or the parents or anything that was between them and our producers in a very quiet back room but we'd often have guests who'd had a dna test or something that we would not provide or had a lie detector test we would not provide because we wouldn't provide those in cases of violence domestic violence for for ethical reasons but those guests would go on his show uh, everything would kick off they find themselves a really 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 in extra deep poo and they would come to our show and we constantly found that we were unraveling a lot of stuff that had been stirred up or had come about as a result of being on their show. Now, they do have inverted commas aftercare. I'm not sure whether their aftercare involved a, a psychotherapist. I'd have to look at, at Graham's qualifications, but we do involve um, counsellors, qualified counsellors qualified psychotherapists um, and you can see that from from our website we're linked up to certain charities who would no way link up with us if we didn't have and I didn't have those credentials he is doing it for entertainment because he seems to just love to make people look stupid and I have an issue with that hmm. because I think the people who are going on the program probably aren't as savvy as he is or you are if it rates, they'll put it on. And if it's between um, the gorgeous Lorraine Kelly show and this morning, um, it'll rate. It's it's not a difficult slot to 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 keep ratings in that place. So you can you can afford to be a bit adventurous, and you can afford to be a bit nice. I mean, if I was a producer and I was working, if I was an executive producer and I was working on the Jeremy Car Show, I would send him away to do a proper sort of basic course in psychology and, and counselling. But then that would spoil it, wouldn't it? Because he wouldn't be able to call people names. And he is a low life scumbag, let's face it. <laughs> move on. <laughs> All right, let's move on from that. Next cab off the rank I need to talk about, of course, is your TV show, because I understand that they're getting rid of it because they can't afford it. That seems a shame to get rid of a programme. Yeah, we well, we um, got so far ahead in making programmes because I worked all through last summer during my chemotherapy um, that, you know, we, we've, as a production company, we've stopped producing the show because we have enough in the bag, you know, to, to go to the end of the year. And no, they haven't got any money. But I, I think what's happened, well, I'm pretty sure what's happened to Channel 5 is going to be happening to a lot of other television stations. Um, ITV is looking at their daytime lineup and the, the harsh reality of economics um, is that shows like Kyle, myself this morning, are very people intensive. They, they employ a lot of people um, and then they have audiences they have a lot of guests they have experts they want you know and they're they're financial juggernauts and television is looking to make cheaper and cheaper programs um programs like loose women for instance on itv um program like uh, programs like um uh, the excellent program that, that comes before ours. Sorry, I've got chemo brain, so I've forgotten Matthew right Wright's show. Yeah. Matthew Wright's great show. Those shows operate on the smell of an oily rag, and and so those shows are the models towards which daytime television. But does uh, it mean they're looking. better though? That's just because they're cheap doesn't necessarily mean they're better, does it? No, it doesn't. But I have to say, in the case of Loose Women and in the case of The Right Stuff, those are I, I picked those because they are, I think, good yeah. examples. I mean, having a journalist, a rigorous journalist like yeah. Matthew do that program adds does add something and gives a voice to everyday ordinary people to mm. comment on what's happening on in the news. And... I have I have to say oh dear I'm going to get into trouble for saying this but I have to say my only problem with uh, Loose Women I mean I, I think it's fantastic that they have women you know across the age groups and what have you uh, how can I say this um, somebody said it's a shame that show is so driven snow now that's a very in <laughs> I don't know what you mean love come on slap what, it on the table what, slap it on, what driven snow means it is very white middle class 
and there's nothing wrong in that but I would love to see more of a mix in their panelists. I mean, I'm thinking people like Shobna Gulati, who's got a lot to talk about. She's she's got a good head on her shoulder. So, um, there, you know, there there are a lot of of people who are from non-Anglo backgrounds who would be fantastic on that show and it would mean that when you're discussing something when you're discussing a subject at the moment you get it from the Daily Express slash Daily Mail point of view maybe with a, a little bit of Daily Mirror in and very rarely do you get the Daily Star unless they have Jim Davidson on but, <laughs> but you know um, it would be nice to have uh, more of a um, a representative mix because we are a hodgepodge society. So do you think it's deliberate then? There is something that comes up at, at, at Edinburgh Television, you know, every year. The fact is the decision making that goes into television tends to, by and large, be made by, we call it the, the Kensington Triangle, so Kensington, Holland Park, you know, maybe the more daring person lives in Islington. But if your, if your staff come from predominantly a particular area sort of area and socioeconomic group they're going to reflect that they're, they're, those are the people they know Is there any diversity backstage at that show do you know? I don't know but it's not just what's backstage it's it's what's genuinely in management and how people are looking at things people often ask how we got the guests we got and, and the range and I know as far as ethnic you know involvement or multicultural involvement I know that the audiences that I had both at ITV and um, Channel 5 were the most ethnically diverse and we know that on ITV because ITV used to use us for certain surveys etc mm. so um and people say how do we get the guests we have our staff totally re reflected we had a guy who was an ex burger flipper we had job <laughs> share we didn't just get our kids from from university some of them were we had asian black we had every hodgepodge single you know mum all right then, Trisha, i've got a question for you yep I'm the executive producer of Loose Women. I pick up the phone and I say, Trisha, do you want to come on Loose Women as one of the presenters? What do you say? I would say, yeah, I'll do a couple of days a week, but I'm a mum, so I can't schlep down from Norfolk every single day. Yeah, I would, I would, I would do it. I did do actually. Loose Women in the early days was made by Anglia at, at Anglia Studios, mm. and they used to ask me to do quite a few shows because. I'm very flattered that our show was rating, my chat show was rating so highly that by coming on the show when it was in its fledgling days and people didn't kind of know what it was, it, it assisted the ratings and it made people think, oh, okay, that's, that's what it introduced people to, to Loose Women. Mm. So I, I was right there at the beginning. And in fact, producers from my chat show were behind Loose Women in its early days. Mm. So Do you think it was a better show when Kay Adams presented it? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I think it was a different show because obviously if you put someone with a journalistic leaning towards mm. it. Um, Colleen Nolan was on the other week. She felt that. Did she? Yeah, yeah. She Did said she preferred, she, she felt she gave gravitas to it. It's become a bit silly. She said there was too much mm. laughing and nonsense on it. Yeah, I do think you need to have a journalist because initially the idea came from uh, the American program. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at The View, which is the American program, which yeah. I was, I think I was, I was approached years ago about going on. But um, they have people like Barbara Walters. They have, you know, Connie Chung. They have... Whoopi they Goldberg also, now Whoopi presents Goldberg. again. <laughs> yeah, Whoopi Goldberg. But they have a whole range. But, you know, we say Whoopi Goldberg. Yes, she's a comedian. But I, again, I've met Whoopi. She's a she, star. She, well, she has got... So, you know she's the sort of person when I met her she was just trotting around New Orleans on her own no entourage yep. she has a deep interest and has done a lot of stuff behind the scenes on social issues she's a businesswoman because she's got her own production company she so there's a lot of gravitas to Whoopi uh, on top you, you think of you know sister act and what have you yep. so she she's she's a 360 degree woman and of course, if you want to see a picture of Trish and the gorgeous Whoopi Goldberg, it's in your book. It is, yeah. See, I have read it. <laughs> yeah. Listen, we could talk all day because I haven't even touched the surface. We've got your cancer to cover and all that. Will you come back on the show again? I'd love to. And can we do it face to face? Because you're at your home yeah. uh, in somewhere in Barbados or somewhere. Oh, <laughs> Norfolk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm in my studio here. So, oh, very funny. What would you like to do next? That was a question I was going to ask you that is important. How about we fire Jeremy Kyle and give you his show again? 
Oh, you know, I don't know. I, I've done daytime chat shows for 11 years. Um, I've loved doing the bit of radio that I've done. i tell you what I'd like. I would like, if I could have anything, I would have a radio show on BBC Radio 4 because they, they have approached me and they've been honest enough to admit that the sorts of guests I get to talk to me and the demographic to which I appeal is one that they've completely got a diddly squat idea of attracting and that they would like to. So I I really love to do a radio show. I, I have to be honest, you know, Vanessa Feltz at first, you know, I had my question marks about her. I think she's brilliant on radio. I think radio was the best thing that happened to her. Well, she's her got a face radio. for radio, you see. That's what he tells Oh, how cruel. <laughs> she's, she's quick. She's bright. She's on the button. Um, she's a bit mad with some of her ideas, but she works on radio. Mm. I think she. I think she's a very, t- very talented lady when it comes to radio. I would like to be the poor people's Piers Morgan try saying that quickly I think there's I think there's a slot for and it would be very cheap for a daily half hour commercial half hour show where um one on one where I could interview people behind the news because I know I've done interviews with people who normally Well you're a communicator that's what you are yeah, it doesn't matter yeah, who ba- you're talking to Well Baby P's grandmother contacted the mm. show came on the, to the show um, you know th- there's been a lot of people in the news Colin Stagg what have you a lot of people in the news who actually say you know I've never done any interviews before but I'll come on to your show and I think there's a slot for a daily half hour um, with an interactive element on, on you know online afterwards to discuss the issue i really Mm. think that that's on my wish list well good luck to you i'm sure you'll do it because you're so tenacious and good at what you do there aren't many people like that you've got a new book in the stores final question then of these four people rate them best to worst yeah trisha (laughs) vanessa jeremy jerry who's got the best show (laughs) well i'm totally biased so i'd say trisha vanessa Jerry and who's the other one? Jeremy Kyle at the bottom. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. Trisha Goddard, thank you so much for talking to me. We've thank been on you. the same radio station for the last year and a half, and of course I wasn't live and you weren't there, and we've never met yeah. each other until now, so it's lovely. No, it's lovely to meet you. Trisha, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Alex.